All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Olfer here with you. We're glad that you're with us, and we hope that you're ready for another study from God's Word. We're excited to have you, and we hope that you have your Bible, pens, and papers, and uh, are uh, sitting attentively listening, and we want you to examine what we're being, what is going to be said today and see if it lines up with the Bible. We never ask you to take what is being said at face value. We want you to examine the scriptures like they did in Berea in Acts 17 verse 11. And so we hope that you will certainly do that. We, we're uh, open to uh, questions and uh, discussion. You know, we want to be uh, scrutinized and investigated, you might say. And so we hope that you'll do that. Uh, the phone number, if you want to be part of the program, is, is uh, area code 336 Four two seven nine six nine six four two seven nine six nine six. That's four two seven W M Y N or six two seven nine five six three six two seven nine five six three six two seven W L O E. Or you can call me on my cell phone two seven six three four zero two six five three two seven six three four zero two six five three, and that'll get you on the air as well today. We have a, uh, I think I have a pretty good lesson for you today. We're going to be talking about uh, a couple different things. I. We'll start off by saying uh, I had some agreements uh, with two preachers over the past couple of weeks to um, have Bible studies, uh, and so I'm going to let you know how that went, and uh, you might be interested to know that one of them was with uh, Mr. Wendell Sparrow from a Christian Worship Assembly, and the other was uh, Andrew, mm, I, I just can't remember his name, it starts with a P. Uh, he was an he's an, an elder with the Jehovah's Witness, and uh, so um, uh, I'm going to give you an update on that uh, before the program ends today. And so I hope you'll stay stay tuned for that. But today our lesson is going to be about simple obedience. We're talking about uh, simple obedience. What does it mean? What what does it not mean when we're talking about uh, uh, obedience? What does that mean? Well, we're going to be discussing that today uh, coming up here on the Word from the Lord. The Word from the Lord is brought to you by the Church of Christ. We'll meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. And if you would like to assemble with us, Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible class, 10 a.m. for worship, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Uh, for Bible study. And that's you know our Bible classes at 9 a.m., uh, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. are, you know, they're open discussion. You know, you can come and ask your questions. And so we hope that you'll do that uh, that very thing. And so uh, um, if you would like to have a, a Bible discussion, that's the place to be. Also, if you want to reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com, you can send me an email at word from the Lord at gmail.com. Just, just the name of the program, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. That's all together, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. R two seven six three four zero two six five three. So you can reach me. So, all right, friends. So let, let's let's talk about obedience for a minute. You know, uh, I want to start off with number one. Second uh, Timothy chapter two and verse fifteen. Second Timothy two fifteen. Some people may you may know this by heart. You may recognize it once we start uh, talking about it. But in Second Timothy chapter two and verse fifteen. Paul said, study to show thyself a prudent to God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So understanding how to use the word is the most important thing. Now, friends, if you want to learn, if you want to learn how to rightly divide the truth, you, you should go to an expert. If you want to learn how to, to work on a car, you want to learn, want, uh, learn how to, um, the best way to uh, operate on a, a person or you want to know the best way to bake a cake or you want to know the best way to do anything. If you want to know the best way to do something, the best thing to do is ask someone who is skilled at that. Now, when you do that, when you do that, there's going to be two sides of your instruction. Now, that's the same way it is with the Bible. Listen to this. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul said, Study to show thyself a prudent to God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if you come down just one chapter later, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. 
So here's what you have. Notice you have doctrine and you have instruction and you have reproof and you have correction. All of those those four things are listed here and they're, they're kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. They're kind of on the opposite ends of the balance beam, if you will. And Paul says that all scripture is profitable for those four things. So if you rightly divide the word of truth and you handle it aright, then you will have the proper means to instruct individuals because you'll have the right doctrine and you'll have the proper tools you need for reproof and correction. Now, those two things kind of go hand in hand. You cannot, you, you cannot uh, have uh, reproof and correction and say that you've been thoroughly taught. And likewise, you can't have instruction, and uh, or you can't have uh, 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 education. You can't have education unless you have the right teaching or right doctrine. So, the Bible is the best source for that. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It's the best source for instruction and doctrine, or for teaching, and it's also the best source of correction and reproof. So, if you want to know how to do something, then you ask that expert. You go to the Bible. In this case. And when you go to the expert, sometimes the expert's going to tell you what you shouldn't do. Because I, I don't know about you, but any time I've tried to learn how to do something, whatever it may be, there's always going to be a time when I had to be told, well, no, that's not the right way to do it. That's, that's the wrong way to do it. This, you know, you, you, have to, you have to correct. And so that's the learning process. That's how you learn. And so the best source for learning is the scripture and the best source for rebuke or reproof or correction is the scripture. And so th that's why the Bible has to be obeyed because it should be followed, it should be followed completely in order to make that man of God perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. And so you have to know to rightly divide the word of truth. And that means in simple terms, just obeying the gospel, obeying the word, doing what God says. Now, I, I certainly believe that obedience to God is a must, and I believe most people in the religious world would say that. As a matter of fact, most of the time, that's you know that's that's where people say, "Well, just obey God." Well, that's kind of a broad term. What does it mean to obey God? It depends on the situation or or the context or what we're talking about. So, but when we're talking about obedience to God, uh, and we're following the Bible, the way you follow, uh, or the, excuse me, the way you obey is you look at the Bible and you do what God says. You don't deviate. You don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand. All right? You, you, you strictly follow the Bible. Now, sometimes when you start telling people what the Bible is teaching, you're giving them a word from the Lord, and they don't like it because it will it, it follows in that category of rebuke or correction. And, you know, a lot of people don't like to be corrected. And when they, when you correct them, or you say something that needs to be corrected, or you talk about something that needs to be corrected, then oftentimes you're criticized. And sometimes I say, uh, uh, you know, hyper uh, criticized, but you're simply stating, stating what God says need to be done, whether it be the positive or the negative, whether it be this is what you should do or this is what you shouldn't do. And one of the ways that people uh, criticize. Uh, uh, folks in the church of Christ that call us Pharisees or hyper-conservative or strict or legalist or something like that. As a matter of fact, I would like for you to uh, listen to a, uh, I'm going to read you a comment that was made. This is from uh, my YouTube channel and this was a comment that was made on one of the lessons from a couple weeks ago. And in this, in the lesson I actually made a comment on about the prom and it seemed, it probably it seemed to have struck a nerve with this person, BF. I don't know who that is. But this is the comment that they made. It says, James, have you ever been to a Chili's bar or grill restaurant or possibly a restaurant that has ever served alcohol in their establishment, even if you do not drink the alcohol? If so, you need to repent because you're guilty of asking for trouble with going to a restaurant that serves alcohol there. You are guilty by association. This is the exact nonsense of the whole problem debate. Well, I don't like going to those restaurants, not because of any kind of guilty by association. I just don't like to support the, the, the liquor industry. So that argument really doesn't 
you know, weigh anything with me. But the idea of of being in a place that is, uh, you know, where what immorality is is being partaken of, that should, you know, that should be a, a flag to any Christian. I don't want to be part of that. Anyway, this person goes on and says, talking about the prom, the prom debate. He says, we are only showed that dancing was wrong two times in the Bible at Sinai where the Jews were dancing naked and worshiped the golden calf idols and when Herodias danced seductively before Herod and it caused him to lust. You have no biblical example of non-lewdness dancing causes to sin. Well, friends, let's just stop right there. And I know I'm kind of chasing a rabbit here for a moment. But when you talk about the modern dance and the things that go on at the prom and you see the way people are dressed at the prom, uh, I think this person, BF, whoever that is, uh, BF's illustrations actually fit the prom very, very well. Uh, people dancing naked. Most of the people that you see, the, their dresses are so low cut or high cut or, you know, backless and strapless and whatever else and no telling what the, the, the guys may be wearing. But that that would definitely fall in the category of, of what you just described there about the, the Jews dancing around the golden calf. And then when Herodias danced seductively, I mean... Really? You mean to tell me that there's no seductive dancing going on at the prom? Really? Come on. I mean, you must be living under that. You must be living under the rock somewhere. Uh, I mean, just take a look around. Any of the modern dancers are so lewd and crude. That's that's what goes on. And so, don't tell me I have no biblical example of non lewdness dancing. Uh, I have plenty of examples though of lewdness that's being that's being uh, exhibited in the Bible. And I went on to talk to, to answer this person and I, and I just showed him the word lasciviousness and I haven't gotten a response from him. But, uh, or her, I, I don't know if it's a male or female. But, but nonetheless, I, I want to get back on track here. Uh, he says, why is it the church thinks that lust, sexually immorality, and drinking only happens during that time, during the, the time that prom happens. Well, I don't think that. I think that that lust and sexual immorality and drinking happen outside of the prom too. I wouldn't just limit it to the prom, so I don't, I don't know why you, you draw a circle that tight. But anyway, here's his comment. This type of legalism is what hurts the church in evangelism. Now, from the way this person is talking, I'm assuming they must be a member of the Lord's church, and if that's the case... They definitely need to repent. I mean, this is not this is not the Christian attitude to have toward immorality or things that that would promote immorality. But yet, this person says this is the type of legalism that hurts the church in evangelism. Pharisees and Sadducees were guilty of this as well. Now, if you simply say you don't like prom or your family will not attend that function, and there's nothing wrong with your opinion on that matter, but to say it from the pulpit is sinful. And you've overstepped your uh, step where the Bible is silent. Well, I have plenty of where the Bible speaks on such matters of lewdness and uh, sexual immorality and the uh, the promiscuity that happens at the prom. Uh, and I've given them this person uh, plenty of those answers. And uh, I can do so on this program if you care to. That's really not where our lesson is going today, even though it may seem so. I'm getting back on track. I know where I'm going. All right. So so here we go. So, But this this person, because they didn't like what was being said, the correction or the instruction or the rebuke that was being given in this matter, fires off with the legalism. Well, you're a legalist. You know, Pharisee, Sadducee, and so forth. Well, friends, the only alternative to that is to be an illegalist, right? I mean, you're either a legalist or an illegalist. I prefer following the law. Because why? Because I want to be obedient. And then to say that that's Phariseeism, no, friends, have you not read your Bible? The Pharisees were a group of people that did not obey. They were they they may have held strictly to the law, and, and Paul said I held strictly to the law, but the Pharisees also did things contrary to the law. Now notice this, in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 2, Jesus said, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, 
All therefore whatsoever they observe, uh, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So he says that they're hypocrites. They say and do not. Now, they know the law, and they know what the law says, but they don't follow the law. See, they don't obey it. And so we're talking about obedience here. Uh, you want to say, well, you're, you're being a Pharisee here when you're talking about things like this. No. Uh, in this matter, a Pharisee might not follow the law. I mean, a Pharisee would, uh, uh, could just as well do things that would exempt him from, uh, uh, from the law and say that he was, he was serving God. I mean, he, he could very well, I mean, if he could uh, uh, not give to the Lord or not good to his parents because he said, I gave it to the Lord and disobey uh, God's command to honor my father and my mother, then I mean, I'm sure there's a way to justify whatever was being done. So, but obedience is not, or, or legalism, as this person says, or being a Pharisee, is not the same as being obedient. Now, the Pharisees claimed to be God's children, but they really didn't. And, and friends, that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about obedience, obedience means you're following, you're doing what God said. Listen to, listen to what Jesus said in John 8, verse 38. John 8 and verse 38 Here's what Jesus said. He's talking to uh, he's talking to these um, uh, the, the Jews, right? And uh, you know he, they're they're questioning him. And this is what he says. He said, uh, "I speak that which I have seen with my father. Ye do that which ye have seen with your father." They answered and said unto him, "Abraham is our father." Jesus said unto them. If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Now, we know what Abraham did. Abraham obeyed God. And thus, Jesus says, you're obviously not obeying God. Verse 40. Now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. In other words, Abraham didn't kill somebody that told him the truth. But yet these people were. So again, you're not acting like Abraham. Verse 41, ye do the deeds of your father. Then say they unto him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil. The lust of your father, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Now, Jesus is pointing out to them that children would be obedient. If you're a child of Abraham, you would be obedient. If you're a child of God, you'd be obedient. As a matter of fact, if you will... Uh, if we turn over to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7, Paul says that, uh, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Individuals who have faith in God and believe in God and obey God, that keep all his commands, then they become the children of Abraham. They are the children of Abraham. And if you can continue on through Galatians uh, 3, you'll find that, Paul uh, concludes by talking about those that have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, and if you're in Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3 and verse 29. So obedience, obedience is a sign or indication that you are uh, obedient to your father. Now Jesus talks to them and he says uh, in John, back in John 8 and verse 47, he said, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, Jesus, that's some pretty bold talk. That's some pretty pretty harsh talking there, Jesus. You, you don't want to make them mad, do you? Well, he's just, he's just pointing out things that need to be said and making corrections that need to be made. Now, if you wanted to rightly divide the word of truth, wouldn't you go to the master? 
I remember if you if you want to know how to do something, you go to the person that does it best, and Jesus would be the best at this. Jesus was a ver was the very best at deciding and determining what was right, what was wrong, what would need to be corrected, what need to be rebuked, and therefore we can follow in that example. But he's pointing out to them that you're not of God because you don't do what God says. Children obey their father. Now listen to what what Peter says. Uh, Listen to what Peter says. I believe it is uh, 1 uh, Peter. Let me look here. 1 Peter, I believe it is. I'll get there in a minute. I want to say 1 Peter 1 and verse uh, 4 is where I want 14. That's what it is. 1 Peter 1 and verse 14. Peter said, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Friends, I just can't, I can't help but notice the connection there. Instruction, instruction from the doctrine, right? Instruction from the doctrine brings about obedience. Now look at this. Peter said, obedient children, because why, why are you obedient children? Because you're no longer ignorant. See, friends, when you learn the truth, when you learn the truth, obedient children obey it. If you're going to be obedient, you, you uh, if you want to be a child of God, you have to obey the truth. And so that's really what we're talking about. So Jesus said, you're not doing the truth. You, you're not obedient. And another reason why being obedient is not being a Pharisee is because Pharisees neglected some things. See, they knew some things and did or didn't do them, and they neglected the rest. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of men and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. Now, look what Jesus did. He didn't condemn them for what they obeyed. He didn't condemn them for the things that they did, but they were condemned for what they left out, what they left were undone. Now, now friends, my, the point I'm making here is you have to recognize that rightly dividing the word of truth and understanding what obedience is is going to take some instruction, some, some positive things, and some correction, some negative things. And so the Pharisees, Jesus said, well, you, you did some things. You know, you tithe the smaller things, but you left the weightier matters undone. You know, you didn't do the most important things or the greater, the greater things of the law. And then on top of that, then they added to what was required. So instead of just doing what God said, oftentimes what they would do, they would add to it. Notice, in Mark 7, verse 13, Jesus said, you made the uh, word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So you add these traditions, the things that are not found in God's word, you add them to God's word, and you insist that they be obeyed, they be followed, when they're not really from God. Now friends, if, if, some, if a man is telling you that you have to do something that's not in the Bible, that's not in God's word, friends, that's, that, is, that would be Phariseeism. To say that you have to do something that's not in God's word. That would be, you know, uh, uh, being like a Pharisee, you know, adding to, to the law. But simply saying that the Bible condemns something like the modern dance and going to the prom and things like that, that's, that's certainly not condemned there. But all through the Bible, obedience is what is stressed. Would you consider uh, Luke 6 and verse 46? Jesus said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Now, you can't call Jesus Lord and then don't do what he says. But yet there's a lot of people that think they obey God because they say Lord, Lord, and they think they obey God because they have done something of what God says. Or they think they have obeyed God because they have done something similar to what God required. But friends, that's not obedience. That's just not obedience. Obedience is doing 
what the Lord says uh, in the way he said it. Now, why, so why do we stress obedience? Friends, the reason why we stress obedience is because, number one, it brings blessings. That's what brings blessings. Um, do you know the first time obedience or obey is used in the Bible is connected with the promise of a blessing? In Genesis 22 and verse 18, God said to Abraham, And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. I think that's pretty significant. Think about the fact that you're saying, well, I, who, who doesn't want a blessing? Who doesn't, who doesn't want a blessing? And yet, they insist on disobeying God. Rejecting God's counsel, rejecting what God says, to the point that even they were even rejecting their salvation because they won't do what God says. Now, friends, if, if Abraham was blessed because, or if his seed was going to be blessed because he obeyed God's voice, well, won't you be blessed if you obeyed God's voice? And God's voice can be heard through his word. Through his word. That, that's, that's God's word. Or that's how you hear God's word. John 17 and verse 17, Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. Right? And then you have... Uh, Jesus saying that God speaks through what he's written in Matthew 22 and verse uh, uh, 29. Jesus said, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they are neither married nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, and then he quotes, so obedience, obedience is hearing God's word, hearing God's voice and doing it. And hearing God's voice today is listening to the Bible, reading the Bible, listening to it. That, that's, that's how God speaks. God speaks through his word. You're not going to hear an audible voice from the, you know, from the uh, darkness that you don't know what it is. You know, some, some uh, mystical voice appearing to you like, Samuel, or, uh, yeah, like, like, like Samuel, you're not going to hear that. But what, if you want to hear God talk, just open up the Bible and read it. Open up the Bible and listen to it. Open up the Bible and hear what God has to say. But Abraham was blessed, or the nations were blessed, because he obeyed God's voice. And God's voice can be heard through the Bible, which is truth, and therefore truth should be obeyed. Now, uh, you might say, well, I don't know. James, I think that I have obeyed God. Well, let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about what your obedience has done and where your obedience has gotten you, and let's just see if you really have obeyed. Because you might be saying, boy, I sure feel blessed. I have a lot of blessings. Listen, you may have a lot of blessings, but that doesn't mean that you've been obedient to God. You say, well, how do you know that, James? Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said that God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. There are some blessings, there are some blessings that everybody receives, whether they're, they're good or bad, whether they've been obedient to God or not. Some blessings come because of the result of others. Some, some people get to partake of blessings even though they themselves have not obeyed God, just like Abraham. In the case of Abraham, Abraham obeyed God and all nations were blessed because of him. And you think about that. If Abraham hadn't obeyed God, then there would be a lot of people that wouldn't have a blessing because, uh, because he chose not to obey God. There's a lot of people that are blessed because their parents obeyed the gospel and now they're blessed because they, in turn, now are getting to hear the truth and they don't have to fight and wade through all the denominational garbage that's out there they're blessed because someone else obeyed. Now, there's going to come a time when, you know, children are going to grow up and they're going to have to give an answer and they're going to have to choose to obey God or not. But the bottom line is, there's a lot of people that are blessed because other people have obeyed God. I would say that this country as a whole, you know, by and large, has been blessed because 
people in generations past, not everybody obviously, but in generations past, more people obeyed God or were concerned about obeying God than they are today. I think there's a direct correlation to the fact that more people or fewer people are reading the Bible, studying the Bible, engaging in a, uh, a life where they're trying to let the Bible direct their steps and, and uh, guide their lives, and the result is our nation is deteriorating. Well, when, when people stop trying to obey God, I'm just going to say it that way, when they stop trying to obey God, when they stop trying, even though they may not be doing completely, they still... Uh, you know, they, they hinder the blessings. But imagine what it then is like if you do obey God. Listen, in Exodus 19, Exodus 19, here's a good example of what obedience means. It means listening to and doing what God says. Exodus 19, verse 5, God tells Israel, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure, treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. All people are a treasure to God. But God says those individuals that keep my commandment, my covenant, are a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people. Now, there, there, there is a blessing of obedience. But now listen to what he says. Come down about a few verses later, or a few chapters later. Exodus 23, 21. Exodus 23, 21 and 22. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if ye shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then will I be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. There's a lot of blessings that come from obeying God. A lot, lot, of, lot of blessings that come from it. And so obedience is listening and doing what God says. Now, friends, the reason why we stress obedience is because that's one way that you're going to ensure God's blessings. But there always comes a time when people just don't know what obedience is, or they think they have obeyed, or they think that obeying is too difficult, or maybe they think obeying, obedience is uh, not significant enough, if I put it that way. Did you know in, in uh, the word obey is found in the New Testament 19 times, and the word obedience and obedient is found 20 times? Now think about that. Uh, 39, 39 times these three words, obey, obedience, obedient, are found in the Bible. It must be important to God. Now that's not, that's not counting all the times where he says keep my commandments and do them and do it the will of my Father and things like that. Just the word obey. 19 times in the New Testament. Now when you read Hebrews 5 and verse 9, it's clear that there's a connection to salvation, the greatest blessing of all. Hebrews 5 verse 9, talking about Christ being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Christ is a good example of obedience. Christ is a good example to obedience. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But I want you to consider, I want you to consider uh, uh, some uh, illustrations. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 5, we read about Naaman. And I know probably many people know the, uh, the account of Naaman. He was a leper. He was a, a captain of the, of the Syrian army. A great man with his master, honorable, uh, because by him the Lord had, delivered, had given deliverance into Syria. But he was a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And so the, his wife's maid was a little uh, Israelite girl. And she says, you know, I wished he, I wished he was with the prophet in Israel. Uh, he'd cure him of his leprosy. And so the king writes a letter to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel, you know, says, what is, you know, what's going on here? And Elisha says, look, just send him down to my house and we'll take care of him. And so, and I'm, I'm really paraphrasing. But when he gets to Elisha's house, 2 Kings, uh, 
chapter 5 and notice what happens in verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot and stood in the door at the door of the house of Elisha and Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Simple obedience. Just, just do what you're told. Right? Go dip seven times in the Jordan and thy flesh shall be clean. Uh, but Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now, why is it that obedience makes people mad? You think about that? I mean, here's Naaman. I mean, he's a leper. Wouldn't you want to just get rid of this horrible disease that in those days there was no, no cure for? And, but yet he gets mad because, because the cure wasn't thought he wasn't what he thought he should get. I mean, it's like going to the doctor and, the doctor, and you say, Doctor, I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sick. I'm terribly sick. I, I need, uh, uh, you know, I need a shot. And the doctor says, well, what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you a prescription for some pills. That's not what I want. You get the same result, you know. But we get mad because the doctor didn't give us what we want. Well, here's Naaman. Naaman was wroth. And all he had to do is go wash in the Jordan seven times and come again. Uh, and thou shalt be clean. Uh, thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. So... Uh, go dip seven times in Jordan River and you'll be clean. But he didn't want to do that. Now, what is so hard about that? You know, when it comes to obedience to the gospel, there's a lot of people that just they want to fight that. They don't want to. They don't want to be baptized. Or they'll say, "Well, I'm going to be baptized in this way, or I'm going to do things this way." You know, I'm going to go. I don't want to be baptized in uh, uh, with uh, uh, immersion. I want to be baptized with pouring. Friends, there's only one way to be baptized. I mean, baptism itself is a burial. So, uh, Colossians chapter 2, which we'll get into in a moment. But here's, here's a, a Naaman, and he says, look, I've got, I've got my own alternative. No, just do what God said. And his servant said, look, if the prophet had bid you do some great thing, you'd do it. Wouldn't you? And so he says, you know, well, yeah, I would have. And so then he does. He goes and obeys. And when he obeys, his child, his flesh came unto him uh, like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So he was cleansed because he obeyed. Now, friends, why is that so hard? But yet people, they fight obedience. They, they fight doing what God said. But, you know, if you don't want a good example of obedience, just think about about Jesus for a moment. You know, the Bible puts Jesus, the author of our salvation, uh, as a prime example of what it really means to obey. Uh, let's go to Philippians, if you're writing this down in your Bible, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to, well, we'll start in about verse uh, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But now watch this. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself. Friends, that, that's, that's a key to obedience. And sometimes you got to humble yourself. You got to you got to you know humble yourself down and say, you know what? I I need to submit to God. And that's what obedience is. It is that idea of of submitting, of uh, of being under, if you will. Uh, if you'll go with me, uh, notice notice this. In let's see. Uh, in the New Testament, when you're talking about obedience I should mean the Old Testament 
it care, the obedience on the Old Testament is the idea of to hear or to listen. And that, that's really what we're talking about. You hear with reverence and you, you obey. Uh, in the New Testament, it's the idea of subordinating yourself. In other words, you're submitting to a thing or to a person, and thus we have you know to obey. And so when you talk about submitting, you're humbling yourself to a greater. You're humbling yourself to someone who's greater than you are. In this case, we're talking about God. Now, I, I just don't know why, if someone was told this is what you must do to obey God, why would you rebel at that? Right? Why, why would you rebel at that? Uh, but go with me, if you would, to, uh, let's see, let's look at um, 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, we're going to read about Saul. First uh, Samuel 15 and verse 2 Thus said the Lord of hosts I remember that, that which Amalek did to Israel how that he laid in wait for him in, in the way when he came up from Egypt Go now smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man and woman infant and suckling ox and sheep camel and ass and Saul gathered the people together and numbered them from Tilium 200,000 footmen and 10,000 footmen of Judah so you got 210,000 uh, people. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Canaanites, Go depart, get you down from the Amalekites, and I, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the children of Israel. And so they, they parted. Verse 7, And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, which is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But the but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And then when Samuel goes down to see Saul, here's what Saul says. Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. God didn't think so. Samuel didn't think so. But Saul thought so. Now friends, would you say that Saul obeyed God? God told him to utterly destroy everything and he didn't do it. And Samuel said, well, if you've really obeyed the Lord, verse 14, he said, if you've obeyed God, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Samuel said, look, I, I could close my eyes and I know you didn't obey God. I don't have to see. I don't have to see the sheep and the, the goats and the cattle and the oxen, whatever. I don't have to see King Agag standing there. I can hear it with my ears. You disobeyed God. You can't, see friends, don't be like Saul and say, well, I have done what God said. I've performed the commandment of the Lord. I've, I've been obedient when you didn't do what God said. If someone tells me, well, I was baptized. Okay. You were immersed? No, I was sprinkled. I was baptized. You were immersed? No, I was, I had some water poured over me. I was baptized, oh, when? Well, when I was a baby. Had some water sprinkled on me. No, friends. That's not obedience. You can call it obedience all you want to. God won't call it obedience. Because in the Bible, a baptism is a burial. Colossians 2 and verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Baptism is a burial. Uh... You know, don't uh, don't confuse someone saying something is baptism when it's really not. I can tell you a thistle is a rose, but that doesn't mean it is. That doesn't mean it is. And by the way, again, why make why make bap why make uh, obedience so hard? I mean, think about it. I used this illustration this morning. Uh, here is Saul, 
and he's going to spare the best of the flock. Now, friends, I've worked cattle before, uh, sheep and pigs and uh, cattle, all different kind of livestock, and there's sometimes you have to separate them. You know, you have to call them. And it takes a little time to go through them and pick out which one you want and cut it out of the herd and separate it from the rest of them. You know, you want to get a calf out and you want to work it and vaccinate it. And, yeah, it takes a little It takes a little effort. It's not like just going through and, you know, next one up. I mean, there's been times when we've vaccinated animals and it's like you just cram them in a, a chute and run them through the chute and put them in the, uh, you know, the squeeze chute and lock the head gate down and while they're in there, you give them a shot of this and a shot of that and you put a tag in their ear or clip their horns or whatever you want to do to them and out, open it up and out they go again. Next one up. But now, when you stop and slow down, you go, all right, you know, we're doing, we're going to separate all the bulls from the heifers and then we're going to separate the cows from the calves and we're going to do this and that and yeah, it takes a little time. And I'm saying here is Saul saving the best, the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs. It took some time to go through all that and disobey God. It took some time to go through, well, that one's good. No, nope, that's slaughter. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Let's save it. No, that's slaughter. See, sometimes it takes more effort to disobey God than it takes to just obey God. And there's a lot of I mean, people, well, I'm, I'm going to go through a little trouble here. Uh, I don't want to just uh, sing. I want to sing and play. Friends, it takes a lot more effort to disobey God by rolling in the piano and pulling out the drums and the guitar and the harmonica and the smoke machine and whatever else you're going to have, it takes more effort to disobey God doing all that stuff than it does just to sit down and sing. See that? I mean, you say, well, what does the Bible say not to, friends? We're talking about obedience here. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, Ephesians 5 and verse 19, what has God said? He said, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Speaking, singing. Where in there, where in there do you hear playing? You say, well, well, that, that's the same as obeying. No, don't tell me it's the same as obeying. Just because you're doing something that God said, you're singing and playing, you're changing what God said. You know, just, if you add something to what someone wants, that's not what they want, right? If I if I go to a restaurant and I tell them I want a piece of chocolate pie and they bring me some chocolate pie and on top of it is cream gravy, you say, well, I brought you some pie. Yeah, you brought me some pie, all right, but that's not what I wanted. I don't want gravy on it. I just want a piece of pie. All I ask for is a piece of pie. I shouldn't have to tell you, don't put gravy on top of it. No, I like gravy, right? I like gravy, but I didn't order that. And so don't tell me that you've obeyed God when God says sing and you say, well, I'm going to sing and then slap a good old ladle of, of a banjo on top of it. That's not obeying God. That's not obedience. That's not obedience. Obedience is demonstrated by doing what God says. And friends, sometimes it means having to say, you know what, that's not right. That's not right. Jesus said, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. What were some of the things that God commanded? Well, some of the things that God commanded that we therefore have to observe and teach others is that you're wrong. You have to tell people you're wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm quickly running out of time here. Uh, by the way, the phone lines are, are open if you would like to call in. Uh, area code 336 427 9696, 427 WMYN, or 627 9563, 627 WLOE. 
But listen, Apollos was taught out of his error. You go back and read Acts 18. Acts 18, verse 24 through 26, Apollos was a, he was a smart man. He, he was an educated man. He knew a lot. Uh, he was eloquent, eloquent, the Bible said, mighty in the scriptures, instructed in the way of the Lord, but he had to be taught the way of God more perfectly. And that's exactly what Aquila and Priscilla did. They took him unto them and expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. You don't, you don't get to teach someone the way more perfectly without saying, uh, this is wrong. You don't get better at something without someone telling you, here's a better way of doing this, or here is the correct way to do this. See that? It shouldn't, it shouldn't, bother, uh, it shouldn't bother people when they're told, well, you know what, that's not what the Bible says. Let me show you what the Bible says and how, how to do this according to the Bible so that you can be pleasing to God. In Acts 19, uh, in Acts 19, there's a group of people from Ephesus that were taught the way more perfectly, that were taught the, the correct way. And when Paul finds them, you know, he says, unto what were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. And he said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of uh, the Lord Jesus. So, they had to obey what was right. He said, well, we learned something. We knew, about, we knew about Jesus. Okay, well, that's good, but that wasn't all. That wasn't all. And so my point is, friends, when we're talking about obedience, you don't get to pick and choose what obedience is, and obedience on the part of the faithful Christian is to say, well, you know, that's wrong. Sometimes it means pointing out what's wrong. I mean, even Jesus did that. Jesus... Uh, told people they needed to repent. In Matthew 7, verse 14, uh, Matthew 4, verse 17, I'm sorry, Matthew 4, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he always did that which was pleasing his father. He obeyed the father. Now friends, that's, that's obedience. And so obedience is not getting to pick and choose what you want to do. It's not getting to pick and choose what or define what God wants or giving God what he wants plus something else. You have to obey God to the letter. Do things the way God said do them or it's not obedience. And if it means having to correct someone and tell them they're wrong, that's, that's part of obedience too. And so, friends, I hope you realize that, you know, when... Uh, when you hear folks saying, uh, you know, or stressing being obedient, don't look at it like legalism. Or when you hear someone saying this is wrong or this is sinful, don't look at it as being uh, legalistic or um, being a Pharisee or being some something evil. Maybe you stop and say, you know what, maybe, maybe there is something to this that needs to be corrected. I mean, Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, friends, that's why we stress obedience. That's why we stress individuals... You comply with what God said. Now, friends, if you say, well, I've, I've obeyed the gospel, and I've been baptized, and I've heard people all the time, I've been baptized. Well, if you were baptized correctly, friends, you would wind up where the Bible says baptism puts you. If you say you were baptized, and it wasn't immersion, then it wasn't baptism, number one. Number two, if you were baptized, and you were immersed, where did it get you? Where did it put you? Did it put you in the Baptist church? That, that's not scriptural baptism. Because baptism is obedience to God that puts you where God says you'll wind up. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the Bible says, uh, Acts 2, verse 42, the Bible says that they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Uh, they that gladly received his word uh, were baptized the same day they were adding to them about 3,000 souls. 
Acts 2, 41. 42, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Verse 47 says, the Lord added to the church daily should just be saved. The Lord does not add people to a denomination that his son did not die for. So you can't tell me you obeyed God and wound up in a church that his son didn't die for. All right? Obedience is important. It, 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 it's crucial. And I, if we can help you, we want to do that very thing. All right, I've just got a few minutes left. I told you I'd give you, um, I'd tell you about some Bible studies that I had scheduled. I actually, uh, a couple weeks ago, I uh, met up with uh, Mr. Wendell Sparrow from Christian Worship Assembly. And uh, he told me to call him on a certain day and we would uh, set up a time to have a Bible study together. So I called him. I called Mr. Wendell and I just got a voicemail. And he hadn't returned my call. And so if you know Mr. Wendell, uh, I'm going to try to call him again. But if you know Mr. Wendell, tell him you would like to have, you would like for him to have a Bible study with me. Uh, we chatted for a good long while. I, I thought it was pretty cordial and courteous. He hadn't actually invited me to his house and uh, met his wife. And, you know, it seemed everything seemed uh, nice. But I hope that... Uh, you know, I hope that comes to pass. I'd like to, I'd, I would like to sit down with him, and uh, maybe if you know him and you, you could tell him that uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from him. The other Bible study that I had was actually more definitive, even than that. Uh, uh, met with uh, some uh, folks from the Jehovah's Witness that were out door knocking, and uh, we, uh, I, I told them that they never have Bible studies with me. I always want to have Bible study with them, and they never want to have Bible study with me. And so uh, a few days later, one of the elders, Mr. Andrew, I can't think of his name, uh, came by, and we agreed to have a Bible study uh, uh, Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, he said he couldn't get to it Friday. We were supposed to have it yesterday at 10 o'clock, and, uh, you know, he just didn't show up. And I, I don't know what it is about Job's Witness. They... They send out they give out pamphlets that say they want to study the Bible. They encourage you to study the Bible uh, in their worship assemblies or with them in private. And but yet for some reason they never they never come back. So uh, if you know Mr. Andrew or you know someone who's a member of the Jehovah's Witness, you might ask them. You know why is it y'all won't study with James? Uh, especially when when they're out door knocking looking for Bible studies and. Then when they say that they'll be glad to have one, they never come back. I suspect he, well, I, I won't speculate. I have some ideas about why he didn't come back, but I would like to uh, to have a Bible study with him, and I'd be glad to have a Bible study with you, friends. If you would like to have a Bible study, uh, you can uh, email me at workmanlord at gmail.com, or you can call me 276-340-2653. Come visit with us, 250 the Boulevard, 9 a.m., on Sunday, 10 a.m. on Sunday, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Um, you can um, uh, you know, you can call me on the phone. I'll come to your house, or we can meet somewhere, you know, somewhere neutral of your choosing, whatever. We can meet at the building, wherever you want to meet. If you want to have a Bible study, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, if you're interested in, in talking about the Bible, uh, friends, we love you. We care about you. We really, you know, we really want to see you obey. The Lord. That's that's really our goal. Um, Paul said his his goal was to help people obey and to uh, open their eyes of their understanding and to uh, render obedience to the gospel. And so that's really what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to to do that very thing: turn people to the truth, uh, turn them away from the doctrines of men, and that will that will uh, uh, bring them closer to the Lord by being a member of the Lord's church. I've got just one minute left, friends, so I do want you to consider, uh, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you obeyed the Lord? If you uh, are in a religion or if you find that you're practicing believing something that's not the Bible, have you really obeyed? Till next time, friends, thanks for listening and tuning in. i uh, be glad to hear from you anytime. Give me a call, 276-340-2653. Always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. God bless and have a...